right, hey guys, welcome to Mercy Hill today. Before I dive into our sermon uh, for today, I wanna piggyback off of this announcement that you guys just heard at all of our locations about, uh, about Kids Week and about the ways that you can be involved. Y'all, our kids, our kids ministry has experienced a ton of momentum over this last year. Uh, it's crazy, I went back and looked at when I did this pitch last year and, I, and it was the same growth. We've seen 30% growth uh, this year, uh, over, over you know, week over week, this time last year, just in this one ministry alone. And I don't know about you, but that just about excites my heart more than anything. Our greatest steward, our greatest you know, resource to steward and disciple and, and really send out is this next generation, our kids. So man, I love what God is doing in this ministry. A ton of momentum that is there. Uh, we've seen things like, man, our, our High Point campus, as new as it is, over 100 kids worshiping there just about every single week. We have over 275 adults that serve in this ministry. Uh, I just want you guys to know there's a ton of momentum in this ministry and, and like everything at Mercy Hill, when we, when we kind of see a Holy Spirit fire like that, we wanna pour a bunch of gasoline on it. And that's what this Kids Week is all about. And so I wanna call you for just a minute here to think about your engagement of kind of repping the kids ministry here. Uh, think about engaging in Kids Week. You know, our, our kids team has put together some God-sized goals. Somebody told them that, uh, you know, God is honored by big prayers and he honors big prayers, okay? And so they just went ahead and set a goal of seeing 900 kids come to Kids Week this, this year across our four locations. And in order to see that happen in a Jesus exalting, safe and fun environment, we need about 500 adults to step in and, and to be here to facilitate this for the kids that come to this church, but also for all the kids that will come uh, from the community in order to hear the gospel. Some of them will hear the gospel one time all year. That's a fact, all right? But we know church, that all, one time is really all it takes sometimes. And so, man, we wanna put that on for them and be able to invite the doors and throw the doors open and not just say, hey, if you're part of our Mercy Hill Kids ministry, then you can come here but to be able to say to a lot of kids, parents are looking for their kids to have something to do during the summer, not really involved in another church, to say, hey, come and be involved in our kids week this year. In order to see that, we're gonna need to see about 500 adults step off the sideline and into the game for this week. And so uh, I just really wanna push you to think about that. I wanna push you to pray. I wanna push you to ask God that we would see that many volunteers, see that many kids. Man, pray, pray for some kids specifically in your family, in your neighborhood. I wanna push you to invite, okay? Uh, man, bring, you know, yeah, if you got kids, bring them. If you got family members, bring them. There's kids in your neighborhood. Man, throw them in the car, bring them up here. Maybe tell their parents first, maybe not, okay? But uh, you might wanna, you know, you might wanna bring them up here. But thirdly and finally, what I wanna push you to is be involved and be one of the 500 that is counted that says, man, I wanna stand in and, and create an environment uh, for the kids of the triad to come in and to hear about the love of Jesus in a safe and fun environment. Man, be one of those people that comes in. This is what I've learned doing ministry, okay? And I've learned this over years. And I don't know exactly how God's math works, uh, but this is, how, this is how it is. I don't know why it's this way, but I know this is how it is. We think that attendance drives engagement. You know what it, you know what it actually is? Engagement will drive attendance. Here's what I mean. If we see the 500 volunteers, I bet you we see the 900 kids. And I don't know how God works like that. I don't know exactly what it is. Maybe it's preparing the jars or whatever you wanna call it. But if we see the 500 people step in and say, man, we're ready to see God move. Like we will be counted, we will pray, we will invite, but we will also serve. Uh, then I bet you we'll end up seeing some crazy things in terms of the amount of kids that come to our Kids Week and hear the gospel. And so I'm gonna call you guys to jump in. We need an army, okay? We need an army of stay-at-home moms to converge. We need an army of, of, uh, of college students that are home for the summer to converge. We need an army of people, men and women in our community uh, that come, come from our church that, that, listen, you work outside the home, man, you're thinking to yourself, well, what can I do? Well, you could take time off, <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds crazy. It's like, man, you're asking me to take a week off? Yeah, or maybe take a day off. Dude, I don't know what you can do, uh, but take some time to be here. I, I, I want you to know this. The first 60 volunteers every single year uh, for Kids Week, I don't know, 60 or 70 by now, is the Mercy Hill staff team. There's nothing else that will go on the whole week. Everything else will shut down for that morning. We'll come back, we'll do work that afternoon, but that morning until that afternoon, we will be here. Man, I will be here every single day. I want you to know this. I will not be here to wave at everybody in the morning and then go work on something else, all right? I have established myself as part, of, I've got some, something of a reputation of being on the security team now, okay? So uh, I'll be on the security team and I'll be here. And I know, I know what you say. You say, hey, well, that's fine, but I mean, you work here and I, and I understand that. But somebody's got to preach that week. 
okay? And you can ask my wife. I'll work every single night that week all the way up. And I know it's not exactly the same thing as taking a day off, but I'm just telling you, a lot of us are going to make sacrifices to be here. And I want to ask you to do that as well. Uh, I'm going to tell you this. You have a shot over Kids Week to make it. I look for areas of my life. Where can you put in 10 and get back 100? Anywhere it is, relationally, with everything else, you have an opportunity to put in 10 when it comes to, man, a few hours for a few days and know there's gonna be kids here. One week changes an eternity. And so we're gonna call you to jump off the sideline. You can jump on our website and sign up to serve. Uh, just go to mercyhillchurch.com, all right? Now let's dive into the sermon for today. We're gonna be in 2 Samuel chapter 6, and I wanna talk to you guys today about the nature of worship. And what I wanna to talk to us about is the fact that we have such good news in the gospel that it should push us to greater depths of passion and no matter where we are in our walk in terms of our expression to the Lord in worship, no matter where we are, we should always, myself, all of our elders, everybody should be thinking, man, just like everything else in my life that grows, just like how my evangelism grows, my generosity grows, my passion and expression in worship should grow over the course of my life. Many of us think, well, I'm wired a certain way, I'm oriented a certain way, therefore, it, you know, that's just kind of set. Nothing in our life is set, all right? We can grow till the day we die, and I'm gonna push us to grow. And I know this about Mercy Hill. In general, this isn't true of everybody, okay? But in general, we are a church that sort of leads with the mind, all right, we're a church that's sort of, man, I, I, I'm in, I wanna go deep in the Bible, I, I wanna go deep in my knowledge and that kind of thing. And so a, a message like today is one of those really great messages that can sort of rub us a little bit the wrong way and pull us toward passion. God didn't just capture our minds in the gospel, he's supposed to have captured our hearts and that comes out in the way that we worship, all right? Now what I want you to, what I want you to see today is this, here's the big idea. The goodness of the gospel pushes us to worship. All right, the goodness of the gospel pushes us to a response. I don't wanna, I'm not talking about rules today. I'm talking about a response today. It should push us to respond with passion. And, uh, and, and really, man, in life, and you guys know this, I mean, just think about any avenue of life, the goodness of whatever news you received is pretty much the exact measure of the response that you're gonna get. All right, however good the news is, that's how good the response is gonna be. That's how big the response is gonna be. Some of y'all saw this on the news the other day. I was just blown away by this. Robert F. Smith, billionaire, top, one of the top 500 richest people in the whole world. He has given a uh, commencement address, the 135th commencement address of Morehouse College in, in uh, Atlanta. And some of you guys saw this on the news. He, stand, he stands up there, he's in the middle of the commencement address, he's talking to everybody, and then just right in the middle of it, he sort of drops it on everybody. Hey, me, my family, our foundation, uh, we've sort of just made the commitment that we're gonna pay off the class of 2019 student loan debt totally. We're making a grant to pay off the whole thing. Now, if you, if you, saw, if you saw the video, if you go back and watch it, it's so funny. The moment was very anticlimactic. Everybody's like, what did he just say? You know, like, are you kidding me? One, one guy said like, man, I heard it, but I just thought, dude, I'm so hot, I must be hallucinating. I mean, they're outside in Atlanta, you know? And uh, I mean, but, but, all, but slowly, you start to see this reaction sort of start to build where the kid, you know, students are all looking at each other like, are you kidding me? And all of a sudden now the students are starting to jump up and down. They're starting to hug each other. They're crying. Oh, the parents, you know what I mean? They're all, they're just totally, I mean, they're just going bananas. The, you know, the, uh, you, you got the alumni, they're all going crazy. And, and it was just a really crazy, crazy moment. $40 million investment. Some of these students have student loan debt coming out with a four year degree of $200,000, okay? And they just had it forgiven. How would you react? Well, the thing I want you to see, maybe you know where I'm going with this, but I want you to imagine the 2019 class, 135th commencement address, top 500 person, richest, you know, top 500 richest person in the world. He stands before everybody and let's just imagine that we're all in that scene. And here's what he says. He starts really, you know, getting after it and he's kind of whipping up the crowd and he's like, man, in the presence of your parents, in the presence of the class of 2019, in the presence of all these alumnus who I want to provoke, you know, to do good works like this in the future, I, Robert F. Smith and my foundation have committed to pay every library fine for the, for the class of 2019. Right? What would happen if that if that's if that was the everybody that's got a library fine? Not today. I've paid it off, and the whole place collectively yawns. Right? Why? Because the goodness of the news. That's fine, you know. But the goodness of the news is so much greater when it's like, no, man, you're freed from this debt. 
You're like, you're not gonna walk into the next. Think about the goodness of that. And, and, and what I want you to see is that if there's a library fine uh, type good news, nobody's gonna lose their dignity. Nobody's gonna become contemptible in other people's eyes. I'm using that language intentionally. That's the biblical language today. No one's gonna become abased. What they're gonna do is they're gonna say, well, I'm just gonna kind of stand here with my hands and I'm gonna, oh, that's, that's Robert F. Smith, thank you. You know, I had a $3.50 library fine. I really appreciate it, Mr. Billionaire, you know, but you, you've, done, you, you've done me a great service. Nobody's gonna shout. Nobody's gonna jump up and down. The goodness of the news is not good enough for us to look around and to say, I don't care what you think or you think or you think, I'm dancing, I'm in the aisles, I'm, I'm crying, I'm excited. I'm not doing any of that because the, the news isn't goodness enough, good enough. But when it's the whole debt, and see, that's what I wanted to get you, you guys to see today. The goodness of the gospel pushes us to a place of worship that really nothing else should be able to. Why? Freed people worship freely. If, I, if there is, and you think about that with these people, hey, I'm jumping up and down because my debt has been canceled. Well, church, what about us when I give you the news today that because of what Jesus Christ has done, we have missed hell and gained heaven? What if I tell you today, hey, because of what Jesus Christ has done, you can get into a relationship with the divine author of the universe today, and you don't have to fear him even though you are more sinful than you could imagine. Because of Jesus, you are more loved than you ever dared hope. Like, what is that pushing us to what is our response to that? Man, are we responding to the gospel like we would a library fine being paid for us? Or, man, is there something deeper that's going on, something deeper that should be going on in our hearts and in our minds? All right, here we go. We're gonna be in 2 Samuel chapter six. Let's start in verse one. What, here's what I wanna show you today. I wanna walk through this passage, make sure we understand it pretty well. And then I wanna come out uh, for us. And I, I want us to think about the goodness of God more. And I want us to think about the opinions of other people less. And I think that's gonna push us collectively to all take a step on the ladder of being expressive and, and passionate in our praise and worship. Let's dive in, all right? Second Samuel chapter six. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart. I want you to footnote in your mind, new cart, and brought it to the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and Ohio, I, I don't know how to say that, it sounds just like Ohio, okay? So Ohio, the sons of Abinadab were driving the, again, new cart with the ark of God, and Ohio went before the ark. I know that I told you last week I'm dropping you guys into the greatest miniseries never written, all right? There's a ton of backstory here, and so let me just try to catch you up. I think I can, especially if you're newer, let me try to catch you up. The ark of the covenant, maybe something that you, you know, have maybe some kind of conception of from Sunday school, or maybe you remember back when the Indiana Jones movies were still good, okay? I don't know how you know about something of the Ark of the Covenant, um, but either way, let me give you a little, a little refresher. Don't have time to go all the way into it. The Ark of the Covenant was God's representation on the earth that dwelt among his people. Now, what, what I want you to hear in that, there's a lot in it, all right? There's a bunch of artifacts in it that push people to his goodness, the way it's constructed pushes people to his goodness. There's a lot of imagery that comes out of the way it was built that, that pushes us all the way to Jesus. You see some of these things in the New Testament. But the big thing that I want you to see is that the Ark of the Covenant is the representation of God among his people. David, in 1 Chronicles 28, calls the Ark of the Covenant, this is really good imagery, at least for me, it helped it click. He calls the Ark of the Covenant God's footstool. Now, what does that mean? His throne is in heaven, his footstool on the earth. It's like, man, this is the place that we go. This is his representation. Now, why is the ark, it's all rejoicing, everybody's excited. Why is the ark coming into Jerusalem, the city of David? Well, the ark has sort of been in exile for generations. And you gotta, get, you gotta dig back in and you gotta get back to some other stories to understand this. But just quickly here, all the way back in 1 Samuel chapter four, the ark of the covenant was captured by the Philistines. And some of you might, if you have any Bible in your background, you might remember inklings of this story. But what happened was that the people of God wanted to win this battle so bad, they bring the Ark of the Covenant to the battle as if it's a rabbit's foot, as if it's a talisman. 
All right, they they act like it's a mascot. I thought about, you know, you you guys saw in the announcement video, we have the City Project students. This summer they were just in NYC. Um, The City Project student we have living with us, she's she's from here, but she goes to the University of Georgia, okay? And this is what they've done. It's it's like a football game where they've got the mascot there so they can go rub his head, you know, the bulldog, because they want to have a a really good game. That's what the Israelites have done. They've put the Ark of the Covenant out like it's a mascot, like it's a rabbit's foot. Well, they lost the battle. How many people died? How many many you think? 30,000. How many people is David raising up to go get it? 30,000. Okay, so they, 30,000 people die and they end, up, uh, they end up losing the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant goes to the Philistines. They end up having it, they don't want it, okay? I mean, God breaks out against them. People start dying, there's plagues. Uh, their idols are all falling down and all that stuff's happening. So they, the Philistines take the Ark, they take it right across the line in Israel and they drop it and nobody has wanted to mess with it for years. And now David has gone to get it, to bring it into the city, to bring it into Jerusalem, United Kingdom, put it in the central nervous system of the whole community so that everybody knows, man, this is where the Lord is among his people, his representation on the earth. Now, we're kind of caught up, so here we go. David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord. Of course they were. They have a king. Man, they've got a, their, their God is here. I mean, all, everything's going right. Songs, lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put his hand to the ark of the Lord and took hold of it for the oxen stumbled. All right, so that's, think about what happened. The, it's on a cart. The ox stumbles. It's about to fall. And Uzzah grabs it, right? I mean, how many of us maybe wouldn't do that? I mean, you know, it's like, man, we don't want it to fall on the ground. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there besides the ark of the Lord. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And that place was called Perez Uzzah to this day. Y'all, if you've never heard this story before, I bet you didn't see that coming, (laughs) right? It's like, man, we're worshiping, we're excited. Everybody's coming, we're bringing the ark. The representation of God is coming back into the city of God. And all of a sudden, here we go. God's mean, he's capricious. Somebody touches the ark and he strikes them dead for it. You know, many people have read this passage and uh, you'll see a lot of people are skeptical and maybe this is where you are today. You might even be fairly skeptical of God and the Bible and all of that. A lot of times passages like this are what people point to and they say, see, the God of the Old Testament is mean. He's capricious. He sort of just does whatever he wants to do and, and, and I can't ever believe in something like this. And Christian, let me just tell you, when we see things like this that are a little bit odd and somebody wants to point to it as an argument against God or against the Bible, normally, now some things are harder than this, but normally if you're willing to dig about six inches under the service, it resolves in about two seconds. And that's what we're gonna end up seeing here, <clears throat> all right? There's two things practically that I want you to see. One of them comes right from this idea of, of the ark, uh, of, of Uzzah dying from the ark. One is because of what they were doing in terms of worship. The other is because he touched the ark. Let me deal with both, okay? And this resolves pretty quickly. You realize that they are totally breaking the commandment of God by carrying the ark on a new cart. See, nobody, nobody thinks, like, well, God killed. No, no, no. Why is there a rule in the Bible that says, uh-uh? The ark has rings on it and the Levites who are the priests, they carry the ark everywhere they go. And, and, and oh, by the way, it should be covered and you don't carry it on a new cart. You don't just carry it however you want to. See, the capricious mean God actually is a good loving father who gave the rule because he didn't want to see the consequence among his children. But what are they doing? Well, they're just doing whatever they want. Actually, they're doing worse than whatever they want. Where did they learn to carry the ark around on a new cart? Well, actually, when the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant, how do you think they were carrying it all around into these different places on a new cart? They've adopted something from this people who doesn't know the Lord. They don't love the Lord. They're their enemies. They're using that in their worship. And this is what I want us to see practically before we really get, I think, to the heart of this with Uzzah and his sin. Y'all, it's an old tactic respun in our day. But you could drop this right into 2019 from, 2000, from a couple thousand years ago. The enemy says, worship how you want to rather than how God requires. And that is so where we live. Have you guys ever realized or have you seen, I mean, this is just sort of the air we breathe. It's almost like we got to get out of the fishbowl. <clears throat> but where we live in today's society is this, passion and sincerity trump truth. Like it doesn't matter what the truth is. What matters is, are you passionate about it? What matters is, are you sincere? David, Uzzah, Ohio, all these people that are worshiping, oh, they're passionate, they're excited, they're sincere. 
and they're not doing the right thing that God has called them to do. They're not worshiping him in the way that he has called them to worship. Instead, they have decided to worship in the way that they want to. And this is what I want to tell our church today. This isn't the big idea uh, here of Uzzah. I think the deeper thing is Uzzah and his sin. We're going to get to that. But before I do, church, we've got to realize it's possible to be super passionate and wrong, (laughs) right? Like it's possible to be sincerely wrong. And that's what's going on with Uzzah. There's passion, there's sincerity, there's excitement, but they're wrong. And I think about our day and age. I think about the person who might say, hey, I love to you know, worship. I just don't assemble with anybody. I don't go to a church. I'm not part of a covenant community. There's no elders that are, <clears throat> are sort of looking over my life. I love to go worship, but I love to do that on my own, by myself, in the mountains, on the lake, you know, I, I, I love to worship, but that expression of worship isn't the way that God has said. It's not through singing with other believers. It's not through my generosity uh, to the church and, and to, the, to the community. It's not through these means. No, no, no. Instead, my worship is a spiritual connection that I have alone. It's my truth or whatever. See, there's a ton of passion there, but there's not a ton of obedience there. And th- this is what I would say, hey, if there truly is a God in heaven, we worship him in the way that he has called us to worship, not the way that we just decide to. Is that not right? I mean, th- think about it like this. If somebody's going to worship you, then you go ahead and set the terms, <laughs> okay? But if you're going to worship the God of the universe, then what we've got to do is let him set the terms, And what he says is, hey, there's a certain way that we are going to do things here. And no matter how passionate you are and no matter how sincere you are, those things don't trump being outside of obedience and outside of truth. But secondly, and I think more to the point here, and this is where we start really getting at the nerve of this passage today with Uzzah. What is the problem with Uzzah reaching out and touching the Ark of the Covenant? What what, what is the real problem with it? I mean, we would all say, hey, man, like, what? What's the deal? I mean, Uzzah's trying to save the ark. He's trying to make sure the ark isn't busted, that it doesn't touch the dirt. I mean, hey, I would do the same thing. Uzzah's just trying to save God. Excuse me, you don't save God. And that's what Uzzah misses. Some kind of way he's got it in his mind that his hand is less defiling than the dirt itself. He has totally disregarded his sin. He doesn't understand that the nature of us coming to God is through sacrifice because we are so sinful There is no, I touch God. If I touch God and his holiness and his righteousness and I'm holding my sin, zap. That's what it should be. One guy likened it to a piece of tissue paper on the surface of the sun. That's what it should be. And Uzzah misses this. Some kind of way, Uzzah has it in his mind and there is a deep entrenched place in humanity that we truly believe that the dirt would defile the ark more than our sinful hand would. And we've got to get this out. We've got to realize today that what David gets mad about, what Uzzah can't understand, what many of us get prickly about in this passage is we read it and here's what we naturally do. We naturally think, how could God strike Uzzah dead when what we ought to think is how in the world could somebody think their sinful hands could touch God? That's what we should be thinking. And that's what David's going to end up thinking. What we've got to get to is that place in our life where we realize and remember, and if you go back, and I know if you don't have a lot of Bible background, then we're going to, you know, you just, man, just keep swimming in this stream, you'll get it. But for those of us that have some Bible background, Uzzah has forgotten one of the main tenets of our worldview that we build on, which is humans broke the world, (laughs) not the other way around. If I think my hand is less sinful than the dirt, then some kind of way I've got it in my mind that the biggest problem I have is out there pushing in. And the biggest problem we have, according to the Bible, is this sinful self pushing out. It's not something affecting me. It's the effect that I can have on everything else. And Uzzah misses all of that. Well, David probably doesn't understand it right off the bat. I think many of us don't understand it right off the bat because we a lot of times have the same reaction. But the question that we're going to get to here in this next verse is that, and I'm going to rephrase the question. You'll see the way that David writes it or the way that it's written, the way he said it. This is the main question. Uzzah can't touch God, and we can't touch God. How can sinful humanity touch God? That is the question. You live in a day of modernity, but I want you to understand the media has us all fooled. Everything about our society with modernity has us fooled. The amount of people in the world that don't wrestle mightily with the question, how can I touch God? The amount of people that don't wrestle with that is infinitesimal. It is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. 99.9999% of all humans that have ever lived 
have wrestled with the question that David is gonna phrase. And that is, how can I touch God? I know me. I know what's wrapped up in my heart. I know the pride and anger and rebellion. I know those things that are in me. How could it be that I could touch the divine? And that is what David is gonna wrestle with now. Look at verse nine. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, see, this is the way he phrased it. How can the ark of the Lord come to me? That is the question. How can, the rep- how can God come into my life? It can't come into us. It's like he touches the ark, he's gone. That should be us because of our sin. So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his house. And it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of the Lord. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. Now we're gonna get to it here, okay? We gotta ask the question, what changes? They tried to get the ark before and it turned into a big disaster. Now they're gonna get the ark and it turns into a big party. Something's different, what is it? Well, there's a couple things, verse 13. And when those who bore the ark of God, you see that? Those who, bore, those who carried the ark, you go back into First Chronicles, you're gonna realize now the Levites are carrying it. Wait a minute, we've gotten back into obedience. It's good to be passion and worship, but only if that's framed in obedience. Obedience can give way to passion, not really the other way around. Okay, so they're carrying the ark, they're doing the right thing. Now here's, this is really to the nerve of it. They had gone, at, at, they bore the ark of the Lord. When they had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. There it is. Y'all, what is it that David is gonna remember? What is the truth that he is gonna grab onto? What makes it go from a disaster to being something that we all rejoice in? And it's this idea, every six steps there was a sacrifice. There's a sacrifice, there is something. I can't touch God, there's a way that I can touch God. And the only way that I'm gonna become one who can touch God and be in his presence is through a sacrifice. And that's what I wanna wrestle with first. There's only two things that I want you guys to see in terms of uh, kind of points today. The first one is this, worship freely by thinking about the goodness of God more because that's what is motivating David's heart. What was the question? How do I touch God? How did David say it? How does the ark come to me? And the answer is through sacrifice. That's the answer. You could put it like, you, you could ask a question like this. What is it that caused the dance of David? And the answer is, remembering a God who is approachable through sacrifice. It takes sacrifice for me to come into his presence. We don't touch God, but we needed God to do something to touch us and take away our sins so that we could be in a relationship with him. And what we have through the Old Testament, what we have that David is remembering here is there is a protocol, there is a way in which sinful humanity interacts with God and it is through sacrifice. God can't just discard our sin. Somebody's gotta pay for it. And throughout all of history, I mean, from the very first sin onward, what we end up with is a system that God is instituting among his people to say there is a sacrifice. Your sin goes goes on them, this animal goes down so that you go free. That's how it works. He takes the penalty so that you go free. Now, I don't know exactly what it is that David remembered, but in terms of the stories or whatever, but something pushed David to begin sacrificing uh, as he was bringing the ark into the city. And and what I wanna just kind of teach you for a minute is that there are two places that I always go back to in the Old Testament to try to get that idea of sacrifice. You could go to Levitical law, you could go to uh, these these different things, but I think there's two stories that kind of frame this up for us that I wanna wanna point us to and make make sure that we remember together. And the first one is this. The idea of sacrifice, where do we get it from? Where's a couple places we can go to? Adam and Eve were in the garden all the way in the beginning in their sin. What, remember the first thing they did when they sinned? They run away, they hide, they try to start covering themselves. Now they didn't realize they were naked before they sinned, but after they sinned, they realize it and they cover up and they try to hide from God. Well, humanity has been trying to hide from God and cover up ever since. But what happened in the garden, and many theologians have kind of pointed to this, and you see the desperate search for humanity since this point forward of trying to gain what they lost in the garden. What was the covering? What was it in people's lives that made them Adam and Eve where it's like, man, there's no shame at all. They were clothed in the love and acceptance of God Almighty. There was nothing to be ashamed of and they were clothed in his love. When they sinned, that was gone and they start grabbing for a covering. Now, one of two stories, okay? 
What did God do when he came to them? And what did he do when he immediately started putting back together what humanity had shattered and broken? You remember what he did? He clothed them in animal skin. You ain't gotta be a big outdoorsman to realize there ain't but one way to get animal skin, right? So the, one of the first lessons that we get in all of the Bible about God interacting with humanity out, you know, after their sin is that there is gonna take sacrifice in order for humanity to be covered in this world. Sacrifice for our covering. The animal goes down and you go free. The second story that I would point to that just really helps me personally kind of understand the idea of sacrifice is yes, humanity, uh, the animal goes down so that we can be covered, but the second one comes out of Exodus 12. And some of you guys might remember this uh, story if you ever you know, read the Bible very much or if you ever seen the movie The Prince of Egypt. Okay, then you're gonna know this too. But there was 10 plagues, right? And the last plague as the people were being freed from Egypt, the last plague was what? It was that the firstborn in every family was going to die. And so what, what did God tell his people? Hey, if you don't want this final plague to hit you like it's gonna hit the rest of Egypt, then you take a baby lamb and you kill that lamb and you paint the blood on your doorpost at night in the perfect picture of a cross, no doubt, on the doorposts, okay? And you paint that picture, you paint that blood on the doorpost. And when the angel of death passes over, you might've heard the term Passover before, right? They would celebrate this, the Passover feast. That when, when the angel of death passes over, he's gonna look down. And wherever he sees the blood of the sacrifice, he's gonna pass over. And the plague is not going to come to you. If you want to avoid the plague of death, then, you, uh, the, then the animal's blood is what it takes. The animal goes down and you're covered. The animal goes down and you're passed over. What is all this pointing to? David remembers, man, I don't touch God. Sinful humanity doesn't, doesn't touch him. We serve a God who is approachable through sacrifice. Something has to happen for me to come to him. And David remembers this and he enacts the sacrifices and he's coming before the Lord in this way. And y'all, this is the point in the sermon where I just wanna push us for a moment and I just wanna say, hey, I know maybe, you, maybe you're newer, maybe this is some swimmy stuff or whatever, but one of the things you gotta realize is that we look to David, but we look through David and we realize that everything that we are seeing here about sacrifice would one day take its fullest form in the, in, the, in the son of David, the true king, the greater and truer, truer David, Jesus Christ himself. See, there would be another king that would enter Jerusalem. There would be another king that would come. But listen, this king wouldn't come dancing because he was bringing the ark into Jerusalem. No, no, no. When this king came into Jerusalem, he wouldn't come dancing. He would come dying. This king, Jesus Christ, he wouldn't come offering sacrifice he would come to lay down on a cross and to be the sacrifice. See, David couldn't do that, but Jesus did. Jesus is the truer and better David. I want you to see one more thing about this, all right? We look to David and we see, man, David is orchestrating all this so that he can bring the glory of God back into Jerusalem. But you know what? We serve a greater David. We serve a greater king. Jesus Christ became the sacrifice. He didn't dance. He died. But listen, he didn't do it to bring the glory into the city. He did it to bring you and I into the presence of that glory. Okay, I want you to think about it like this. David danced to bring the presence of God into Jerusalem, but Jesus Christ died to bring the nations into that presence. It's one thing to establish God on his throne, but it's another thing to bring the nations, every single tribe and tongue, to build a people to come and to worship him. And that is what Jesus has done. You know, I want you to think about a passage of scripture with me. And this, this isn't on the screen. And I know we're a little bit deep right now, but hang with me. I think it might click with this passage. There's a passage in Jeremiah 3, 16 and 17 that I just want you to hear. I just want you to wash over. I just want it to come into your mind and into your heart. See, David is bringing the ark. David's bringing the glory into the city. But Jesus, the greater king, is gonna bring the nations to worship the God who is there. And this is what Jeremiah 3, 16 and 17 tells us. Man, it pushes us all the way to the end, the end of all time, the end of all things. What's heaven gonna be like? What's the new Jerusalem gonna be like? Jeremiah 3, 16 says this, in those days declares the Lord, they shall no more say the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Listen, it shall not come to mind or be remembered or be missed. It shall not be made again. 
What is he saying? In the very end of time, when there's a new heavens and a new earth and a new Jerusalem, there will not be a need for the people of God to look for the Ark of the Covenant. Why? Because we will not need his representation in the new heavens and the new earth. Instead, we will worship him as he sits truly enthroned. We will worship in the presence of God fully. There's not a representation anymore, verse 17. And at that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of God. We look forward to that day and all nations shall gather to it the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem. David brought the ark into that kingdom. Jesus Christ brings us into that kingdom. And when he does, we have the opportunity not to worship a representation, not to say, man, God is there, but to really bask in his glory as he is seated on his throne. I don't know how much of that David saw. I don't know exactly how much of that he could see, but here's what I know. What David saw dimly was enough for him to dance and shout and praise. And what he saw dimly, you and I see with crystal clarity. What are the depths of salvation pushing you to in the overflow of praise? All right, because here's what I know. When we get through all of that and we get through everything and the goodness of that, we can't worship God like somebody just forgave a library fine. <laughs> we can't worship God in a way that says like, man, I'm gonna worship, but dude, the big thing is I'm gonna keep my dignity. You know, I'm, I'm gonna make sure that I stay dignified in all of this. Instead, we should be a people who ever are, and I'm not prescribing a formula, okay? I'm not prescribing a rule. It's a, it's a response, but our reaction should be, man, I always wanna grow. Like everything else in my life, I wanna grow more expressive and more passionate. Well, that's where David is, but that's not where everybody is. And I wanna conclude uh, today by getting into a little bit of, of his wife. Uh, her name was McCall, and, and she didn't see things the way that David saw them. And many of us in here, if God isn't big to us and other people's opinions will be, and maybe that's where we are, maybe it inhibits our praise today. Look at verse 15. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting with the sound of a horn as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David. McCall, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw the king, David, leaping and dancing before the Lord. Listen, she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Now, I told you earlier that new cart thing, I wanted you to footnote it. I want you to footnote this. Footnote the fact that he blesses them in the name of the Lord of hosts, okay? Because it's just one of about four things in this passage that is gonna push me, and I hope you, to a very interesting conclusion about what David is doing because there's only one other guy in the Old Testament that blessed people in the name of the Lord like this, and his name was Aaron. He was a priest, okay? And there's some things like this that are pushing a sacrifice, linen ephod, Okay, all this kind of stuff going on. Now he's blessing people in the name of the Lord and distributed among the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread and a portion of meat and a cake of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed each to his house. All right, now we're gonna start getting into it here about Mike McCall. And David returned to bless his household. But McCall, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, now this, listen, this said the daughter of Saul, not the wife of David. <laughs> even though she is his wife. There's something going on here about what McCall is wrestling with. What does she say? How the king of Israel has honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his female servants as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. What is she saying? David, you danced so hard your clothes came off. Okay, bud. And you have embarrassed me. What she's saying is, I am a princess. I am the daughter of Saul, and you're supposed to be the king, and everybody's supposed to respect you. And instead of dancing like a commoner, okay, instead of out there going crazy, she's embarrassed. Instead of all of that, you should have been more kingly than you are. And David said to McCall, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father. Oh my, he went there, <laughs> okay, <laughs> above your daddy, all right, and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people, of, the people of the Lord, and I will celebrate before the Lord. And listen, this is the point. And I will make myself yet more contemptible than this. Some translations say more undignified than this. I'm okay with going low in everybody else's eyes. I'll be ashamed, I'll be abased, why? Because when somebody forgives your whole student loan debt, a $40 million investment, $200,000 alone coming out with a bachelor's degree many of these students had. I'm not worried about what anybody else thinks. I'm jumping up and down, I'm excited, tears flowing, all of this stuff. And that's what he's getting at here. The ark, McCall, the ark of the Lord is coming. 
It departed. He's coming into our city through sacrifice. We can touch God. There's going to come a day where we don't even need the ark because he will reign in the throne and the nations will be drawn to him. Don't you see it? Nope, she don't see it. One's dancing for his life and the other is staring out a window. And many of us find ourselves right here. I will make myself more contemptible than this. I'll be abased in your eyes, but the female servants of whom I have spoken, by them I should be held in honor. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. Y'all, there is so much we could do here, but I just gotta make the main thing the main thing because that's all the time that we have. I want you to worship freely by thinking about people's opinions less. And I wanna contrast two people in this story. What is going on with them is not different things. Listen to me, it is the same thing. Okay, you guys were here last week. If you weren't, let me try to recap for you where all of this is going. I know this is a little bit philosophical, but man, it is spot on. Every one of our hearts is oddly shaped like a throne. And something sits on the throne of our heart. And here's what kings do. Kings dictate behavior because they promise peace. And whatever promises peace is allowed to tell me what I'm gonna do. It looks like David and McCall are doing totally opposite things. They're not doing totally opposite things. All they're doing is allowing whatever they have held as the thing that can give them peace to dictate their behavior. And for one, it means dance, it means praise, it means shout, it means throw a party. It means, man, one of the things I look forward to in my week is getting with the people of God and shouting the name of God. That's what it looks like. And for others, it looks like, man, keep your head down, look around, judge others, and don't do anything that you yourself might be judged by. Why? Because the king of my heart is being respectable in everybody else's eyes. And if the king is be respectable, if the king is remain, have a status, if the king is don't be undignified, if the king is an image, that king is promising peace. And therefore, that king is dictating behavior. And for one, it's dancing. And for the other one, is looking out a window. Man, it's sitting on the sideline. It's not even just sitting on the sideline. It's actually becoming uh, ashamed of the other people that want to worship. And this is what I want you to hear. And this is so simple, all right? McCall has learned this, I think, from her father. Do we need any other reason to make sure our kids are at Kids Week? You know, one of the great things about our kids is they learn from everything we do. And one of the most terrifying things in my life is that they learn from everything I do. And I think that's probably true of you as well. We need them here because they're learning things from us. What did McCall, what did McCall learn from? What did, what did she see in her dad? Man, she saw a guy whose heart was shaped like a throne and right on top of that throne was sitting the opinions of everybody else. And here's what I want you to hear. Y'all, when people are big, God is small. When people's opinions are king, God can't be king. When what people think about you is king, God can't be king. It'll push you to things like crazy. It'll push you to be disobedient. Man, it'll push you to lie. At, you, you'll lie to family and friends and work. Why? Because their opinion of you is sitting on the throne and you don't want peace to be threatened. So you gotta make sure they think everything's going really well, you know, because they're gonna think really highly of you. I mean, I could, I could, man, I could, I could apply this a thousand ways. The way we're gonna apply it today though is how is this inhibiting our worship? There are two things that inhibit our worship. Man, if something is sitting on the throne, if, if we think in our mind that the gospel isn't really that good of news, then we're not gonna be a people who are willing to become undignified. And if we think what other people think of us is really king, then we're not gonna be willing to become undignified. But if those two things are smashed by the goodness of God and the goodness of the gospel, then you know what we're gonna do? Unlike McCall who's staring out a window, we're gonna be like David who's making way for the king. Now I got, listen, I gotta dive super deep for one minute. And I want you to hang with me. And some of you may disagree with my conclusion on this, and that's fine. Debate it in your community group, okay? But I'm gonna tell you, <clears throat> and I rarely do this, all right? I don't, a lot of times I don't pull all this stuff together and tell you what I actually think. I try to say, man, this is the word, okay? But I feel like in this instance, I, wanted, I gotta take one more step beyond what I normally would. I want you to see something here. And maybe you'll agree with me, maybe you won't. This is what I want you to see. One's looking out a window, one's dancing. One's worried about looking kingly, And the other, I would say, well, I'll I'll give you my punchline in just a second. Okay, I think he's sort of almost renouncing his king. Here's the problem with this passage. You want to know the problem with it? David is taking the office of king and priest. That's a problem in the Old Testament. Maybe you didn't realize, but it's a problem. McCall's father, Saul, did that one time. He was standing there at a battle, and Samuel, the prophet, wasn't there. The, The one that would come and do the sacrifice, the priest, wasn't there. He was getting a little antsy about the battle, and so he's like, man, bump it. I'm just going to do the sacrifice myself. 
He does the sacrifice. About the time that he does the sacrifice, like a priest, he's the king, he assumes the role of priest. When he does, Samuel comes up and Samuel says, hey bud, today the, king has been, the, the kingdom has been ripped from you. Not you, not your descendants, it's been given to somebody else. You don't do both king and priest. There's another place in the Bible, in 2 Chronicles, all right, 26, where a guy named, a little confusing, not Uzzah, but Uzziah, who is actually a descendant of David, is reigning in Judah. The kingdom splits apart after David, okay, back apart. He's reigning in Judah. He's super powerful. He gets real high on himself, very prideful. And as the king, he decides to go into the temple and he decides to burn incense. And he goes in there and starts preparing things to burn incense. The priest, all the army come in. They're like, you cannot do this. He gets really mad at them. And in that moment, God strikes him with leprosy. He becomes an exile and dies in a leper colony. King and priest. Uh-oh, right? What's David doing? I mean, there's no doubt that David is becoming priest here. The linen ephod is what the priests wore. Go back and look at it. Samuel wore linen ephod when he stood before Eli all those years before. That's what a priest does. A priest blesses you in the name of the Lord. A priest orchestrates the sacrifice. Now here's, I know we're a little bit deep, but here's the conclusion that I take on this and, and maybe you could just kind of bat it around and think about it. Why is it that David is not struck like these other guys where he is trying to be both king and priest in the same day? It's because in my opinion, David is not trying to be both king and priest. He is renouncing his kingship for a day to take on the role of priest. What he's saying is, no, 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 no. I'm not the king today. God is your king. I have a king. David knew, though I'm king, I have a king. And that's what he wants to show the people. And he's ushering them into his presence. Don't you see the difference in McCall and David? That McCall would say, at all costs, look like a king. And David would say, man, I don't even care about being the king today. I'll be as common as you can be. I'll be as undignified as you can be because the glory of God, our true king, is coming into our presence. Whatever's sitting on the throne of our heart dictates our behavior because it promises peace. And my question for us this morning is, what is the king of your heart directing you to do? That's it. What is the king of your heart telling you to do? As the glory returns to a city, one's dancing, and the other's looking out the window. What is the king of your heart telling you to do? As the glory is returning, one sings and praises, the other mocks. What is the king of your heart telling you to do? I don't want you to think for a moment here that I am prescribing exactly what every single one of us needs to do. But I know this, in a church that leans knowledge, we need a a stiff yank back towards passion. And that's what we need. And I think that's what we generally need. So I'm not prescribing a rule, but I'm asking you, man, does the way you respond and react in worship Man, does it fit? Is it, 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 does it, is it a library fine? Or has somebody just said, man, all the debts you ever had, free people worship freely. How are we worshiping today? You know, our worship leaders, I think, at all of our locations, man, they do an excellent job because they don't try to dip us into fanaticism. They don't try to push us further than the Bible goes. You know what they do? They basically take the Psalms and they put it before the people and they say, hey, actually, we don't get to worship in the way that we want to. We worship in the way that the Bible tells us to. And you know what the Bible says? A lot of people say like, well, you don't have to do this and you don't have to do that. And I'm not saying have to, have to, have to, but let me just kind of read some of the scripture to you. Because of your steadfast love is better than life, I will praise you with my lips. So it's like, man, are there times when we're silent in worship? Absolutely. Is all the time silent in worship? That ain't what the Psalm says. It just ain't. I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Well, what is the, do we lift our hands all the time in worship? No. But if we never do, I mean, what, I don't know, man. It's like, don't take it up with me. Take it up with God, <laughs> okay? I don't know. Take it up with the Bible, I mean, this is what he says. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and with lyre, Psalm 149.3. If any of y'all wanna bring a tambourine next week, go for it, okay? I don't know how the worship team's gonna react to that, but you got it. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout with cries of joy. I'm not saying we clap and we shout amen all the time, but if we never do, then we just aren't doing psalms. And I don't know how else to say it. There's a couple of practical things I'll tell you guys, man. Man, let's learn the songs that we do at Mercy Hill. There's nothing right or wrong about the music that we do here, but it is our culture. It is what we do. You can learn every song we do by just typing into YouTube, you know. How about this? If I haven't stepped on your toes already, which is, I probably have already, but this really will, okay. Um, 
How about this? How about, man, we wanna prepare for worship. How about this? How about we get here early and stay late rather than the other way around, <laughs> you know? How about we come prepared? And if I'm rubbing any of you the wrong way, you know what, that's fine, because here's the deal. It would have rubbed me the wrong way when I was, I don't know, probably 18 to 23 or 24. You're, the same sermon would have rubbed me the wrong way. And here's what I would have said. And I want to turn it back on you, okay? So you got to watch this. Make sure you make the mental jump. This is where my heart posture would have been at that time of my life. Hey, I would have said, man, you're preaching, all that stuff. But here's what I would have said. You don't know what's in my heart. Like, you don't know. And that might be what you're saying here. You might say, man, you're judging all this outward stuff. You don't know what's in my heart. Here's the deal. Nobody knows what's in your heart. That's the problem. <laughs> Think about it. If nobody can see what's there, is that a problem? I would say it is because I would say nothing else in the Christian life is that way. You can't evangelize in your heart. You can't give in your heart. You know, there's nothing in the Christian life that is that way. There, there's nothing like that. What's in the heart are, comes out into our behavior, into our action. And I just want to call us, it's not a formula. I'm not saying everybody, you know, we're not getting rid of the chairs and all going to dance next week. Okay, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, it's just like the generosity ladder, just like the course of your life that we've, that we've shared with you guys before, wherever you are on passion and expression, some of that's wiring, some of that's, I get all that. Man, take, let's try to take a step. That's it. Over the course of all of our life, say, God, I want to take a step in my passionate worship of you. That's it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today. God, I pray that you would give us the courage to worship you in the way that you have called us to. Not the way that we desire, the way you've called us to worship. We want to worship you like that. You are good, and your goodness pushes us to praise. In Christ's name, amen.